Hello everyone, my name is Sahil and welcome to the class. Now in the today's video, we are going to discuss a very important topic which has been repeatedly in the news that is the asylum policy for India and even in the conventional sense also, this particular topic has been very important for our examination. Now first of all, let's see the context as why this thing has become important and then we'll be moving on. So recently, there have been the three developments in this particular regard that have happened. Number one, recently, a private member's bill has been moved in the Lok Sabha for the creation of a legislative framework for the asylum seekers as well as to create for a refugee policy, to, for creating the refugee policy in India. Now, earlier also, the bill for the asylum seekers and refugees was moved in 2015. Before that, the bill was moved in 2009. But up till now, it has not been passed. Then the second development that has come is that recently the NHRC, National Human Rights Commission recently has held a discussion for the need of asylum policy for India. And there, they, and there a proposal has been made that now this is high time that India should have their national asylum policy as well as the policy for the refugees. And then thirdly, recently, Recently, an observation has been made in the 35th African Union Summit with respect to increasing military takeovers around the world. Now, let's understand this particular point a little bit more critically and then we'll understand that why asylum policy becomes even more important. So, first of all, understanding it, what has happened? The uh, African Union has observed this particular thing that now again a trend is coming where the military takeovers or military coup are increasing. First of all, let's see what has been the trend in last few years. So basically, the 1960 to 1969 was a period when large number of military coups have happened. Fine, there were 26 successful military coups that happened between 1960 to 69 and there were the 15 unsuccessful attempts that were there during the same time. After that, 1970 to 79 was also the period where uh, there were the 18 successful military coups that happened and then 24 unsuccessful attempts were there. Over the years, this particular trend has come down. And 2010 to 2019 was a period where the military coups were not that much prevalent. Here, there were the six successful attempts that were there. And then uh, here we can see uh, there the nine unsuccessful attempts were there. But now the things are going to be changing. Now the things are changing. What has happened? The African Union has provided that just within these two years, 2020 to 2022, already, already the six successful military coups have happened, including the latest military coup in Burkina Faso, before that in Mali. And there have also been the three unsuccessful attempts. And this particular pace is unprecedented into the last 40 to 50 years, a large number of military takeovers are there. Along with it, along with it, there are certain regions where the terrorist activities are also increasing. Many of the terrorist outfits also, they are gaining the land. Now, what is the problem if these military coups are increasing? When these military coups are increasing, whenever or apart from it, a, a terrorist organization is taking over the power, then the religious minorities, ethnic minorities or people belonging to a particular social group, they face more and more persecution. And the case in point is Myanmar. Case in point is Myanmar. So in Myanmar, in 20, 2021, the military takeover happened, military coup happened. And since then, the persecution of the Rohingyas have increased. And now the United Nation High Commissioner for Refugees, UNHCR, has declared the Rohingyas as the most persecuted community in the history, most unwanted minority in the history. Clear? And after coming of the military coup, after coming of the military there, this thing has aggravated. So around the world, now, the conditions of certain minorities, it is set to decline. Fine. Now, moving on further in this particular direction. Here. Okay. So, where will be the utility of this particular topic? The utility of this topic will be at two places in our GS paper number 4. In the GS paper number 4, at two places it will be important. Number 1, topic number 6, ethics of international relation. 
there when we talk about the international relation asylum and refugees happens to be a very important topic so there we'll see it and then secondly topic number one applied ethics so within the applied ethics also the uh, uh, ethics of asylum ethics of refugees become very important so we are going to see this entire asylum policy and refugee issue under the light of these two topics of our gs4 now moving on first of all very basic thing we hear the terms asylum seeker and refugees and many a time we are using the both in the same capacity. So what is the difference between these two terms? Are they same or they are different? Now understanding it. So guys, according to the United Nation High Commissioner for Refugees, United Nation High Commissioner for Refugees, number one, asylum seeker is a person who is fleeing his home country because of some instability because of some instability. There are the five grounds which have been recognized. Number one, because of a person's religion. Clear, because of a person's religion. Second ground is race. Third ground is political opinion. Political opinion. Then the fourth ground is that the person being a member of a particular social group the member being uh, the person being a member of a social group or participating in some particular social activities and the fifth ground is a nationality nationality so because of these five grounds if a person is fleeing from his home country and going to another country and asking a permission to enter that particular country he is asylum seeker he is asylum seeker now let's take a hypothetical situation suppose this is a country a now there are a lot of people who had faced let's say religious persecution in their home country rohingyas they have faced religious uh, persecution in their home country and now they are running from their country to some another country they come to this a country now these people are standing on the border of this country obviously the troops standing here they will not allow them because they are not having the valid visa and a valid passport so what they will do, they will apply for asylum. They will apply for asylum in this A country. They will say that we are facing a persecution because of our religion. Now let's say that the country A had allowed all of these people that okay, you can come. So once they will go in that country, they will be given some limited rights, some limited rights. And then these people will become the refugees. These people will become the refugees in that country. So who are the refugees? Refugees are the people who have been given some conditional rights in another country and these are the people whose asylum request has been accepted. If asylum request is not accepted, you are just an asylum seeker. Is it clear? Sometimes people don't even make an asylum request. They just enter in a country. So they are the illegal immigrants in that country. Is it clear? So this is the difference between asylum seeker and refugees. Five grounds are there. Now before moving on it, let's see that what is the international framework first of all for the protection of the asylum seekers and refugees when they have entered into that country. So number one, we have the United Nations Refugee Convention of 1951 and its protocol of 1967. According to this United Nations Refugee Convention 1951 and 1967 protocol, refugee, refugees have been given certain rights. For example, they needed to be treated on par with other known nationals into the country where they have taken a refuge. They needs to be given, uh, they have needs to be given a right to practice their religion, to practice their uh, to practice their tradition, culture, etc they are given a right that they can avail the legal remedies in the host country wherever they are going is it clear so many of these principles have been talked into the un refugee convention on 1951 and it talks about the universal protection of the refugees clear now after that there is united nation high commissioner for refugees united nation high commissioner of refugees is an agency which has been mandated to protect the refugees and it also entails certain rights for the asylum seekers. It is headquartered in the Geneva in Switzerland. So it is a specialized agency to protect the asylum seekers and refugees. Then after that, there is also the sustainable developmental goals which are talking about the protection of the 
migrants clear particularly within the sustainable developmental goal there is the sdg sustainable developmental goal number 10.7 it talks about that the states they need to facilitate the orderly safe and regular and responsible migration and mobility of people including through the implementation of planned and well managed migration policies is it clear so it is talking about the migration now the migration at times could also be international migration then there is a, within the sdg goal number 16.3 now sdg goal 16.3 provides that the states need to promote the rule of law at the national and international level and ensure equal access to justice for all though the word refugee and asylum seekers have not been mentioned when we are but when we are talking about protecting the justice at the international level for the people it actually gets applied to the asylum seekers or the international migrants apart from it apart from it there is also the united nation declaration of human rights 1948 article number 14 united nation declaration of human rights article number 14 which provides that every individual has a right to seek asylum if there is a fear of persecution every individual has a right to seek asylum so united nation declaration of human rights article 14 is the most important provision and only on the basis of this united nation declaration of human rights article 14 this 1951 convention has been framed is it clear so guys again we'll repeat refugee convention 1951 unhcr two of the sdg goals and the article 14 of undhr is it clear or not now first of all let's see that what is the india's stand on all these particular things okay now guys first of all india's stand on asylum policy so basically india as of now has not ratified india as of now has not signed has not ratified the united nation refugee convention of 1951 nor india had adopted the 1967 protocol of the refugee convention and at the same time neither we are having our own national asylum policy so neither we have asylum policy nor we have ratified the un refugee conventions up till now clear as of now the matters with respect to the refugees in india they are seen in an ad hoc manner they are seen in an ad hoc manner and in this particular capacity there are some other laws that are there under which the asylum and refugee issues are being seen for example there is registration of foreigners act 1939 there is registration of foreigners act 1939 then there is the passports act 1967 clear there is one more passport act but passport act of 1967 is there fine after that there is the foreigners act of 1946 foreigners act of 1946 then there is the foreigners order 1948 and apart from them there are certain other laws and acts also which are there which are dealing with the issue with respect to the asylum seekers as well as for the refugees now the arrangement here is a little bit ad hoc and specifically they were not designed for the asylum seekers and refugees but under this only we are taking all the request for the asylum and giving the protection to the refugees is it clear now before moving on first of all a very fundamental question comes that why india has not adopted any asylum policy up till now and why india had not ratified why india had not ratified these refugee conventions clear why india has not ratified the un refugee conventions there are certain reasons for this particular thing reason number 1 reason number 1 now guys when we talk about the india india's geography india's geography has its unique problems now the india's neighbors they don't have a very cordial relations with the india sometimes the relations are very much hostile and not only the hostile relations are there the neighbors they have a kind of a history of committing some of such such uh, some of atrocities onto their own people and at times they have came in india now let's understand this particular point in a little bit more elaborate manner for example for example the china china acquired the tibet china acquired the tibet and as china acquired the tibet large number of tibetans came in india post 1959 large number of tibetans came in india 
now if we will have a very clear asylum policy everybody will apply for asylum everybody will apply for asylum even all the neighbors will apply for asylum and when every neighbor will apply for asylum and we'll give them asylum because we are having a very clear asylum policy our neighbors at times will get irritated even till today between the china and india a very big irritant is the india's stand to give asylum to the dalai lama and tibetans because we have done that thing china is irritated even up till now is it clear or not so basically coming out with a uniform asylum policy is not desirable because treating the neighbors and treating the people living in neighbors is to be seen under a geopolitical lens also under a geo strategic lens also so therefore we decide it deliberately on to the ad hoc manner deliberately we have not come out with an asylum policy so to give a customized response here this is one reason then after that the second reason the second reason now the second reason it is basically the reason of basic economics reason of basic economics and india is already one of the most populous country and actually when we talk about the resources that are there already much of the people in our country they are deprived of the basic necessities of life in that capacity in that capacity giving the asylum to other people might not be very much helpful it will put a lot of pressure on india's resources so therefore india has not come out with an asylum policy and only in very very urgent kind of cases only india gives the asylum then moving on third problem india also has seen a lot of infiltration and terrorism a lot of infiltration and terrorism has also been seen for example i will just be taking about one particular case here the assassination of former prime minister of india mr rajiv gandhi assassination of mr rajiv gandhi prime minister rajiv gandhi so at that point of time at that point of a time the bomber who killed the rajiv gandhi the bomber came as a refugee from the sri lanka the bomber came as the refugee from the sri lanka and she posed her uh, she, she came as a refugee from sri lanka but actually she was a terrorist clear so many a times the people from pakistan terrorist posing as refugees will come in india using this national asylum policy okay if we come out with it under the un refugee convention then the fourth reason in this particular direction fourth reason in this particular direction that comes it is see this particular thing we have not signed the 1951 refugee convention because the convention is mostly eurocentric now basically this convention was set after the world war 2 and in the world war a lot of destruction happened a lot of people got misplaced so actually to accommodate them this 1951 policy was designed so specifically it doesn't caters to the need of india and south asia does not caters the need of india and south asia so therefore we have not signed it clear moreover moreover it has also become redundant it has also become redundant 1951 clear more than 70 years are going to happen so it is be redundant then fifthly fifthly there is also a pessimism there is also a pessimism that what will be the unforeseeable impact that can come clear we don't know exactly that what other problems can come and this pessimism has dictated up till now that we should not have an asylum policy rather we should deal it with on the ad hoc basis so therefore india had neither came out with asylum policy nor india had ratified the un refugee convention under which it has to come out with a streamlined mechanism so india had not done it is it clear now further moving on see though neither we are having a national asylum policy nor we have ratified the un convention on refugees but at times there have been many a times the attempts that have been made to rationalize to rationalize the asylum policy number 1 the national human rights commission nhrc proposed a model law for the refugees in 2000 on the basis of pn bhagwati committee on the basis of pn bhagwati committee a model law for refugees were suggested under this model law for refugees it was provided that india had to amend the foreigners act of 1946 india has to amend the foreigners act 
of 1946 and on india a duty was also imposed that india has to define the rights and duties of refugees and every class of refugee is to be given that rights and duties clear so every refugee is to given it now guys first of all when we talk about the refugee questions in india the different different types of refugees are living there are certain refugees from afghanistan certain refugees from tibet certain refugees from sri lanka all the refugees are not equal there are the different different treatment this particular model law provided that you need to treat all the refugees in a similar capacity then after that clear this draft uh, the the model law on refugees was proposed in 2000 on basis of pn bhagwati committee but actually did not got passed up till now clear it talked about uniform rights duties and treating all the refugees in a on a similar ground then it talked the next step that has happened it is the recently proposed asylum bill 2021 which has just been now placed into the lok sabha asylum bill 2021 now first of all let's understand briefly what are the features of this asylum bill 2021 if you want you can take down a noting also number 1 this particular bill this particular bill has given a very elaborate definition of refugees it has given a very elaborate definition of refugees which falls in line with the united nation convention for refugees the same five conditions that are mentioned here it has been accepted under the asylum bill of 2021 that is any person will be asylum seeker if he is fleeing from his home country on five conditions number 1 religion number 2 race number 3 political opinion number 4 being a member of a social group or participating in social activity and number 5 nationality second second this asylum bill 2021 it has also proposed that there will be the creation of the national commission for asylum there will be the national commission national commission for asylum national commission for asylum and this national commission for asylum will be dealing in the matters with respect to the asylum applications it will have a streamlined standard operating procedure on whose basis the commission will just it, it will be giving or will be rejecting the asylum request of the people then thirdly thirdly under this particular bill it has been provided that the principle of non refoulement will be followed principle of non refoulement will be followed principle of non refoulement will be followed mandatorily now what is this principle of non refoulement just in 2 minutes i will explain you specifically a point is there so principle of non refoulement will be followed is it clear just in one minute we'll discuss and then after that it has been provided that arbitrary practice of giving the asylum and refuge will be uh, will be brought to an end so arbitrary policy or arbitrary practice arbitrism the ad hocism the ad hocism in the refugee or asylum or or in the granting of asylum will come to an end ad hocism and arbitrariness will come to an end and a streamlined process will be designed these are the major provisions of this particular bill fine then next there are very important judicial pronouncements also which have recognized large number of rights for the refugees in india clear these judicial pronouncements are also very important we'll just see them but before that just in 3 seconds we'll revise majorly model law by nhrc on the basis of pn bhagwati committee secondly asylum bill of 2021 which has recently been floated thirdly the judicial pronouncements that we are going to discuss this bill the major provisions already we discussed now when we talk about the judicial pronouncements the most important cases in this particular direction are number 1 louis d reddit versus union of india louis d reddit versus union of india now this particular case was very important because here it was provided that even the non citizens even the non citizens they enjoy three rights in india that is the right to life liberty and dignity right to life liberty and dignity are enjoyed even by the non citizens is it clear so substantial protection was given to the refugees living in india second there was the majid ahmed abdul majid mohammed 
जद अल हक वर्सेज यूनियन ऑफ इंडिया और शॉर्ट मजीद अहमद केस मजीद अहमद केस नाउ इन द मजीद अहमद केस द जुडिशरी इन द मजीद अहमद के अहमद केस द जुडिशरी हेल्ड दैट द मेडिकल केयर इज टू बी गिवन टू द डिटेनिज इवन द पीपल हु हैव बीन डिटेन इन इंडिया इवन दे वर लेट्स ए द इ लीगल इमिग्रेंट्स केम इवन इफ दे हैव बीन डिटेन्ड मेडिकल केयर इज टू बी गिवन मेडिकल केयर एंड secondly it has been provided that right to practice religion is to be given to everybody right to practice religion is to be given even the people who have been detained even the my uh, the refugees who are living in india and the third most important case is the nhrc versus state of arunachal pradesh now what happened here first of all in 1996 in 1996 the supreme court in 1996 the supreme court provided this particular thing that three of the fundamental rights are even applicable to the non citizens article number 14 right to equality article number 14 article number 20 article number 21 three fundamental rights article 14 article 20 21 they are available even to the non citizens to refugees even they are to be given now what happened actually in an, uh, actually this particular case nhrc versus state of arunachal pradesh it was for the deportation for the deportation of the chakmas now chakmas chakmas are the tribals who have lived in bangladesh in the chittagong hill tract the chakmas they are the uh, buddhist sorry chakmas they are the buddhist who have lived into the chittagong hill tract in the bangladesh and they have came to india clear now these chakmas are to be deported back fine and the case was uh, was taken that was the nhrc versus state of arunachal pradesh where whether the chakmas should be deported or not it was discussed here the supreme court stopped the deport of the chakmas citing that article 14 20 and 21 is to be given to them and under article 21 the right to life right to life will get threatened if they will be deported back so therefore their eviction was stopped is it clear so louis d read it majid ahmed and nhrc the judiciary had substantially enhanced substantially enhanced the scope of the rights of the non citizens in india is it clear or not fine right? now this is by a high court okay second one now moving on okay after that as we have not given the uh, as we have not come up with the national policy on asylum what are the ethical issues that are coming in this particular direction the ethical issues that are coming in this particular direction a very important one first of all the life boat ethics life boat ethics now what is this life boat ethics so guys here there is a metaphor that is used first of all let's understand the metaphor and then we'll be understanding little bit more here you can see that here's a life boat here there is a life boat now on life boat there are the limited resources that are there there will be the limited water there will be the limited food and the life boat has a limited capacity for example a life boat let's say can accommodate 50 people so a limited capacity is there if only these 50 or let's say that 40 people are there there is a very big probability that they might go to the shore and they will be saved suppose 100 people had come on this life boat clear what will happen at the end of the day none of them will be saved the boat itself either it will capsize or it will submerge clear now applying the life boat ethics in reality now understand this particular thing suppose now it has been said that these life boats are the rich countries stable countries these life boats are the rich countries stable countries and there are so many people who are swimming outside this particular life boat clear these are the poor people these are the persecuted uh, persecuted minorities they want to come on this particular life boat they want to come on this life boat so that they can be saved now what a country can do uh, what or what this life boat can do situation a this life boat let's say let's imagine the capacity of this life boat is to accommodate 60 people already 50 people are there on this life boat so there is a gap of 10 people that is there situation number a what they can what this life boat can do they can accommodate these 10 people 
and in and it can reach to its fullest capacity it can reach to its fullest capacity now if they have reached to its fullest capacity there is not even a small scope of margin is it clear later words it might proved to be fatal suppose the journey extended by few days then these 10 people will consume all the resources and then there will be a lot of chaos that will happen on this lifeboat earlier there was a little bit margin of 10 people now that has been filled this is one approach second approach that could be here second approach that could be here is that what can be done okay they refuse everyone they refuse everyone in that way these people who are already there they will reach safely and the condition number c what they can do condition number c what they can do they can accommodate all the people fine whosoever can come on the lifeboat they can welcome all the people now obviously in the third condition nobody will be saved in third condition nobody will be saved in second condition 50 people for sure will be saved in this condition there is a probability that the 60 people can be saved or nobody will get saved let's say there is some unexpected thing that came is it clear and the margin that was there they have exploited it so countries they have different different interpretation some refuse the entry of the immigrants in their country citing the lifeboat ethics they say that we have a limited resource and we cannot simply accommodate the asylum seekers we can simply not accommodate the refugees they refuse the entry is it clear now now understand this particular thing basically basically the countries they have very stringent asylum policies countries have a very stringent asylum policies or they don't have any asylum policies they say that lifeboat ethics is important and we'll see on that situation that whether we have to give the asylum or not so the lifeboat ethics comes here now accommodating people has its own viewpoints not accommodating people has its own viewpoint we will not be taking one stand that okay you have to accommodate few people or you don't have to accommodate few people it will purely be dependent on that situation fine this is the lifeboat ethics that is there but as an ethical principle as an ethical principle denying everybody will never be appreciable denying everybody will never be appreciable so some people should be accommodated but the moment it comes that some people should be accommodated then question comes that which people should be accommodated clear so this is an controversy that is there it is not solved it will never be solvable but actually the case in point is there that the country should not misuse the lifeboat ethics in just in order to fulfill their selfishness in order to just satiate their self-centricism clear so this is one issue that is there then the principle of non refoulement now we'll, we are going to discuss principle of non refoulement so what is this principle of non refoulement this particular principle says that let's say a person has escaped from a home country to some another country because there was a fear of persecution fine there are certain grounds there was a fear of persecution then the host country host country cannot forcibly send that person back to his home country if there is a fear that he might face some persecution he might face some violence he might face some injury back they cannot force they cannot uh, send that person back that is the principle of refoulement uh, non refoulement now when we talk about the principle of non refoulement there is a dispute in the entire world there are one group of countries who says that the principle of non refoulement will be applicable to everybody even if they don't sign or ratify the united nation refugee convention the non refoulement will be applicable on to them some countries say that no non refoulement will only be applicable if we have an asylum policy if we agree to the united nation refugee convention clear so there is a dispute but largely what is ethical ethical is that there should be the universal application of non refoulement a country should never send back the people back to their home country if there is a fear of persecution for them in their home country this is the, the principle of non refoulement now india india has not been a signatory of the refugee convention let's see what is the india's position on non refoulement so guys in this particular capacity there is one very important judgment of gujarat high court that is the kathir abbas case kathir abbas case now what was the kathir uh, okay uh, what was the kathir abbas case 
in the katir abbas case it was provided by gujarat high court that under the scope of article 21 under the scope of article 21 of the fundamental right article 21 the non refoulement is applicable on india non refoulement is there on india now just very simple logic article 21 is to be applicable to even non citizens clear and article 21 provides for the right to life and will the life be saved if you will be sending some other person back to home country where he might get persecuted obviously no so non refoulement is is applicable in india as provided by the kathir abbas case of the gujarat high court however there is also one issue that have come in this particular direction there is one dispute that had developed what happened guys recently in 2021 recently in 2021 the supreme court supreme court in mohammad salimullah case 2021 supreme court into the mohammad salimullah case had sent back certain had sent back certain rohingyas to myanmar now we see that rohingyas face persecution in myanmar and they have been sent back a batch of rohingyas have been sent back to myanmar so is it a is it a violation of non refoulement is it a violation of non refoulement clear so here justification number 1 comes is that actually india is not having any national asylum policy india is not having asylum policy and india can determine and if india had determined to send them back india is not violative of anything second thing comes that national security is very important and when the non refoulement is there non refoulement is subject to national security and national interest so in national interest they have been sent back it is not violative of non refoulement is it clear or not but sending back has except has attracted a lot of criticism has attracted a lot of criticism it has see it has said that a humanitarian breach has happened humanitarian breach has happened then the num the third ethical issue that comes here is that it is said it is said that there is a shared global responsibility there is a shared global responsibility it has been said that at the end of the day everybody is a human at the end of the day everybody is human refugee migrant asylum seeker these are just the tags that have been pasted on certain people at the end of the day everybody is a human and it is the global responsibility of every country that they should come together and should take care of certain people who are fleeing from their home country because of the persecution do don't see them as some different ethnicities don't see them as some different nationality don't see them as people belonging to one particular group rather see them beyond their such kind of tags and it is a global shared responsibility that we should accommodate them that we should give them refuge in our home country in whatsoever capacity possible is it clear even even in this particular direction even if in this particular direction the deontological ethics can be cited what is the deontological ethics immanuel kant the german philosopher immanuel kant german philosopher he always provided that the ways are important the ways are important when a country when a country let's say is not accommodating a asylum seeker country is saying that we are not accommodating because our resources will get threatened so country in a way is giving the reason of national security country in a way is giving the interest of uh, the reason of national interest now national interest is important national security is important but what is the way that you are taking your way is not good you are denying the refuge to a person who might get persecuted so the ways are important and therefore the country is need to take a moral way and should accommodate the Uh, asylum seekers should give more rights to the refugees this is something that has been provided moreover as a part of deontological ethics immanuel kant has also provided that the humans are end in themselves humans are an end in themselves if the most important entity into the world are the humans everything should happen for the human well being humans are end in themselves and by that logic also giving the asylum giving the rights to the refugees becomes very much important is it clear then there is one more ethical issue that comes in the aspect of uh, uh, refugees and uh, in the aspect of asylum seekers so if you remember if you remember 
I had given you certain grounds on whose basis the refugees will be determined, on whose basis the asylum, the refugees will be determined. Refugee is a person who is living in another home country, fine. And there are five grounds of uh, five grounds that were there: religion, race, political opinion, being member of a social group, and their nationality. In all of them, you will find that the environment has not been mentioned. Environment has not been mentioned. Climate has not been mentioned. There is there is a very big class of climate refugees that have now come that now have come why because of see sea level rise is happening today sea level rise is happening today extreme events are increasing extreme events are increasing there is failure of agriculture that is happening many of the traditional flora and fauna they have lost on which many of the communities were dependent many of communities dependent on some key stone flora and fauna they are getting extended they are getting threatened fine many communities dependent on agriculture getting threatened because of the climate change fine extreme events threatening the survivability of the people in particular region sea level rise threatening the coastlines threatening the communities living on the seashore clear so because of the climate change large number of people had to flee to some another country because survival is not an option where they are living so what about the climate refugees there is a no provision where uh, basically there is even in the refugee convention no point where the uh, refugee uh, the refugees by the wake of climate that are being discussed is it clear or not so on this particular direction it has been provided that the 1951 refugee convention is insufficient 1951 refugee convention is insufficient there is one particular fact also that i want to give you in this particular direction now guys recently recently the oxfam's inequality report oxfam's inequality report was released now what is provided into the oxfam's inequality report it has been provided that the richest 1% people richest 1% people they have emitted more carbon than the poorest 50% combined. Poorest 50% combined. According to Oxfam report, it has been said that richest 1% people had emitted the carbon far more than 3.1 billion poor people. 3.1 billion poor people. And these are the people who are now becoming the climate refugees. These are the vulnerable communities who are now becoming a climate refugees because the climate change, sea level rise. Rich people, they polluted. They polluted. They are living in their mansions. They are living in their abodes. And now they are not doing anything to protect them. The climate refugees, this entire ground is not mentioned. This entire ground is not mentioned. Moreover, according to a report by BBC, according to a report by BBC, it has been provided that the 80% of people who are being displaced by climate, 80% of the people who are being displaced by the climate, they are women, provided by BBC. Clear? But the climate as a ground has not been recognized for giving an asylum or the refugees, they cannot be recognized onto the uh, ground of environment, climate change. So this is some ethical issues which should be addressed not only by India. These are certain issues that should be addressed not only by India, but by the entire international community it should be addressed. And therefore, a responsibility also comes for India. Therefore, a responsibility also comes for India and not only for India, but the entire world. Including this ground is the responsibility of entire world. Non-abuse of life vote ethics is the responsibility of entire world. Now, what is the way forward that can be given in this particular direction? See. India is actually at a paradoxical situation. We don't have a national asylum policy. We don't have adhered to the refugee convention of 1951. But at the same time, we are having one of the largest population of refugees in the South Asia. Clear. India needs to play a role of leadership here. First of all, there is a need that we need to come out with South Asian refugee convention. We need to come out with South Asian refugee convention in which all the countries of South Asia, they need to come together and they need to identify their shared duties. They need to identify their shared duties with respect to the refugees. 
is it clear and all the countries of south asia collectively they need to work together for the safe and peaceful resettlement of refugees peaceful and safe resettlement of refugees is it clear moreover moreover within this south asian refugee convention within this south asian refugee convention two things are to be taken up number one environmental refugees environmental refugees climate refugees are to be recognized second now the people they have also to flee because of other grounds for example the sexual orientation the sexual orientation so new grounds are to be added for recognizing the refugees and to give the asylum environment needs to be recognized and the people who are fleeing because of their sexual orientation it is needed to be added it is needed to be added fine this is something that needs to come out we need to come out with south asian refugee convention second second there needs to there, there there is a need that india should come out should come out with a national law on asylum seekers and refugees now this particular law will come with a rider what is the rider the law should come after keeping the national security national security and national interest in consideration it we are not proposing that you come out with a asylum policy and national security national interest should be ignored no it should be adhered to while keeping the while keeping the checks and balances and while keeping the procedural safeguards while keeping the checks and balances and procedural safeguards the national law on asylums and refugees needed to be created now within this particular law within this particular law first of all within this particular law national law on asylum and refugees number one there needs to be a clear provision that it will overrule all the other legislations that are there for example the passports act foreigners act registration of foreigners act foreigners order all these laws that this particular new national law on refugees and asylum will overpower why because many a times then the conflict will come and then it will lead to some impasse etc secondly secondly there needs to be a kind of a recognized body there needs to be national asylum commission national asylum commission which will make which will be looking in the matter of processing of the asylum request and recognizing the rights of the refugees recognizing the rights of the refugees after that housing and employment benefits should be given housing and employment benefits should be given fourthly government need to come out with a platform where the civil societies and ngos can be robbed civil societies and ngos can be roped so that they can work for the welfare of the refugees is it clear this is something that needs to be proposed clear moreover moreover it is provided that india should play the role of the torch bearer because in the past india has always been accommodative of the asylum seekers and had protected the refugees sri lankan Sri Lankan uh, people, they have been given the refuge in India. Tibetans came with the Dalai Lama, they have been given the refuge in India. Clear? They are living and even the registration certificates have been given to them. So, already India had done very much good, even when we are not having the asylum policy, and even the judiciary has recognized so many of the rights. Is it clear? So, India should play a role of a torch bearer, rather, I'll say a moral torch bearer in the world. And right now, the case in point is the Afghan. Afghan students who want that their visas should be extended and many of the Afghan nationals who want to come in India, their asylum request needs to be seen on a humanitarian ground without jeopardizing the national security and national interest. So, coming out with a law, coming out with the objective SOP, coming out with a commission and creating this congenial framework is something that is needed in this particular direction. Is it clear or not? So, this is all about this particular thing. Moreover, moreover, one more added ad, a point you can add that as we are talking about this domestic law, in this domestic law, the people who are internally displaced, the people who are internally displaced, for them also the provisions are to be made. For example, many of the communities such as the Kashmiri Pandits, they are internally displaced. So, for them also, some humanitarian, uh, so internal displacement also can be taken up here at the same time. So this is all which has been provided in this particular direction. So guys, that is all about our discussion for today. I hope you have understood all these particular things. 
so that is all from my side thank you so much